Thank you to Draper and its Hack the Moon initiative for supporting PBS Digital Studios. Every winter, thousands of tourists head north, past the wall and risking white walkers, hoping to get rewarded with a glimpse of these amazing multicolored lights. And while many succeed, many leave an aurora. Which begs the question, when, where, and how is the best place to see an aurora? Auroras start with the sun, specifically when the sun decides to shoot billions of tons of charged particles, mostly protons and electrons, at the Earth, at speeds that would do some serious damage if we were not surrounded by a protective magnetic field. Our magnetic field redirects most of these protons and electrons around us, but some follow through the Earth's magnetic field lines to their source, the magnetic poles. On their way to the poles, those charged particles crash into atoms and molecules in our upper atmosphere, producing this. Because of how our magnetic field is shaped, and the height auroras typically happen above the Earth's surface, the best place to see an aurora is actually not right at the magnetic poles, but anywhere in an oval-shaped zone about 2,000 kilometers from the poles. This zone is called the auroral oval, and it's much easier to be in the auroral oval if you go north because the southern one is mostly over Antarctica and, well, the Antarctic Ocean. If you're lucky, green. If you're extra lucky, purple, pink, and even blue. If you're the luckiest person on the planet, red. But the most common aurora you'll see is green. The reason's kind of complicated, but we'll take it slow. First, you need to know a few things. One, it's the electrons from the sun, not typically the protons, that make auroras. Two, as you go further up in our atmosphere, there's less and less of the atmosphere, and the gases that make it up change. Down here at sea level, air is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% other stuff. In our upper atmosphere, about 80 kilometers and up, there's actually more oxygen than nitrogen. Three, at those high altitudes, UV light from the sun actually splits oxygen molecules into oxygen atoms. Okay. So, when an electron crashes into an oxygen atom, it excites it to what scientists imaginatively call an excited state. Eventually, the oxygen will release its extra energy as a photon of light. That photon can travel down to the surface of the Earth, where you see it as part of an aurora. The exact color of the photon depends on how much energy it has. Higher energy photons are greener, and lower energy photons are redder. Now, here's another fun fact about oxygen. It has multiple different excited states so it can absorb electrons of different energies. If it absorbs a high-energy electron, then a high-energy photon is produced, aka green. If it absorbs a lower-energy electron, then a lower-energy photon is produced, aka red. Okay, so at this point you might be asking, if oxygen is so cool that it can produce both green and red auroras, how come green ones are much more common? If an oxygen atom absorbs high-energy electrons, it relaxes back down and emits a photon one second later. But if it absorbs a low energy electron, it stays excited much longer, 110 seconds to be exact. You can think of those time windows as aurora killing opportunities. Because if a nearby molecule crashes into an excited oxygen atom, it totally throws the oxygen off its game. That extra energy that would have gone to the photon gets transferred instead to the molecule that crashed into the oxygen. And because red photons need 110 seconds to brew, those red photon emitting oxygens are much more likely to get bashed before they release their photons than the green photon emitting oxygens. There are more wrinkles to the story. For example, nitrogen molecules can also make auroras. Pinks, blues, reds, and purples, and hydrogen and helium can too, but those are even rarer. Now let's talk about... Probably already guessed this, but at night. Auroras are over a million times dimmer than sunlight, so you're not going to see one during the day, unless it's the apocalypse. What that means, though, is that you're much less likely to see a northern aurora in the summer, because the sun is up so much longer. So at night, up north, and in the wintertime. Also, try to avoid the moon if you can, and, well, clouds. Also, the sun is a mercurial beast. The number of particles and how fast they're going changes day to day based on different types of solar activity. But since it takes a few days for this stuff to reach us, we can actually predict the best aurora spotting a few days beforehand. And yes, there are apps for that. PBS is bringing you the universe with Summer of Space, which includes six incredible new science and history shows streaming on PBS.org and the PBS Video app, along with lots of spacey episodes from PBS Digital Studios creators. Thank you to Draper and its Hack the Moon initiative for supporting PBS Digital Studios. You know the story of the astronauts who landed on the moon. 
Now you can log on to wehackthemoon.com to discover the story of the male and female engineers who guided them there and back safely. Hack the Moon chronicles the engineers and technologies behind the Apollo missions. Brought to you by Draper, the site is full of images, videos, and stories about the people who hacked the moon. Are you heading out on an auroral journey? Make sure to bundle up aurorally, tell us your auroral stories in the comments, and we'll aurora, aurora, aurora next week. Try saying that 10 times fast. Thanks for watching.